Awesome. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Hopefully everyone is excited for this uh, the week. I know that one thing I know about people, and being a pastor, is that people like to eat. And so I'm sure that this is probably one of your favorite uh, holidays, like myself. And uh, I'm planning on seeing some people uh, pregnant next week. And I don't mean with human babies, but with food babies. I've never had a food baby before. Afterwards, you just happen to unbutton your pants just to be able to breathe again. But uh, all joking aside, I believe in this Thanksgiving season that God wants to speak to us uh, today and to be able to help us to transform our lives from uh, living a life of thanksgiving to thanks living. Obviously, for a lot of us, we have these seasons where we can really be thankful because everything's going our way, or Thanksgiving helps to remind us that we need to be thankful. And uh, it can be seasons that we only really give thanks to the Lord and to others, but God wants us to give uh, thanks in all seasons. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we see this. And the Bible says, in everything, give thanks. It doesn't say, in some times, every once in a while, during Thanksgiving, give thanks. It says, and everything, give thanks. And then it says, for this is the will of God. It's not, this is a good idea. This is probably the will of God. It says, no, this is the will of God for your life in Christ Jesus for you. So we know without a shadow of a doubt, it is the will of God for us to be able to, to live lives of thanksgiving to the Lord and, and to others and to be appreciative for the things that we have. And it's easy to be thankful when everything is going well, right? Like it doesn't take someone that's this incredible person to be thankful when things are going your way. Even the most negative people you can possibly think of, they're even positive a few times a year because things go exactly how they planned every once in a while. And so it doesn't make you a great Christian to be able to give Thanks, this Thanksgiving, what makes you a strong, mature Christian is being able to live a lifestyle of Thanksgiving, even when things don't go your way. Now, because how are we when things don't go our way? Does our, does our Thanksgiving stop there? When things get messy in our life, and I have two daughters, and uh, this is one of my daughters right here. Her name is Ayla. And, uh, one thing about my daughters is when they were young, they're just messy eaters. I don't know if you had your kids who were just mess eaters. And uh, oh, this was probably her when she was probably like one and a half or so. And I remember one day Dawn left the house and uh, left the kids eating. And uh, Ayla was in her high chair, and Ayla would have been probably around one or so. My other daughter would have been about three. And I just went to the other room to go get something. And I just wasn't really paying attention to the kids much because I knew that they were all right. And uh, they're just watching TV and... Ayla was eating like her baby food or whatever it was then. And I remember walking into the, the living room. And we have a hardwood living room right next to like the kitchen. And we have the table right there. And uh, I look at her. I'm like, wow, she's really messy today. And it just looks like it's coming down her leg, all over her. And from a distance, I'm just thinking, oh, Dawn must have just gave her just baby food, and that's what it was. I wasn't really even paying attention. You know, dads, sometimes you're just like, whatever, the kids will be fine. You know, I know the kids like one or three that they can, they'll make it, they'll survive. And uh, so I go over to see you know, how they're doing, and I get closer, and I'm like, oh no, I don't know if this is really baby food that is coming down from her leg. And I go over to it, and just like the closer I get, I'm like, oh yeah, this is starting to smell bad. This is not looking good. This is not a brownie or chocolate pudding. This is something else. And I go and I grab her to get her out. And I'm like, oh no. This is the worst explosion I've ever seen in my life. I thought it was just on her leg, but it's all up her back. It's everywhere. This is like three in one. And like I've, I've changed a lot of diapers before. I'm not a dad that's scared of changing diapers, but this one was like horrifying. This one was the one that I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this one. And Dawn is gone, and here I am. I'm with, like, a one-year-old child. Got her out. Didn't even realize how bad it really was until I pulled her out, realizing it's all over the high chair, all over, up and down her back, down her leg. It's just the, the biggest mess I've ever seen in my life from a child. And 
I'm just thinking, okay, if I go, if I let her go right here, she's probably going to run through the house. It's going to be crazy. And her diaper and wipes are not right by me. And so my three-year-old daughter's like gagging. She's yelling. She's screaming. She's horrified. She's like, this is so nasty. And here I am. I'm trying to calm her down and yelling at her. I need you to help me out here. I cannot do this without you. My phone is not on me. I think I, this, like I've never had to, like I've never thought before, I need to call Dawn. I need help. You know, it's not good also as a guy to act like you need help. You want them to, to like, you want them to feel like everything's under control, but this time I'm like panicking myself, thinking this is like, I'm not sure if I'm going to, what am I going to do here? I have a three-year-old daughter, and if you have a three-year-old child, sometimes they'll listen and sometimes they won't. Oh, and here she's having a meltdown because how nasty this is. And so I remember it just took a while. It was like five, ten minutes. Finally gets everything I need. I start working on this, and I'm like, hey, you've got to find my phone. And I'm not even sure my phone is, and I'm having her search the house for my phone. She finally finds it. I'm just thinking, hopefully I don't get anything on my phone. It's just terrible. And I call up Dawn. I was like, I need your help right now. I can't do this on my own. Like, get here as soon as possible. And uh, I started cleaning it up. And I think by the time, like, she walked in the door, I was almost done. But it was just a disaster. But life can be like that sometimes where it just seems like all of a sudden just crap is everywhere. Life just smells. It's awful. It was unexpected. Like, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting maybe something small, but sometimes in life, just the crap just gets beyond what we've ever experienced before. How am I going to deal with this? And what happened for a lot of us two years ago, all of a sudden COVID hits and we're just like, what is going on? Before COVID, a lot of our prayer life was like, thank you, Lord, for all these things you've given me. I'm living the blessed life. And after COVID, it's like we forgot to thank the Lord for all these things. And we just asked for all these prayer requests and all these wants that we have. For some of us, we've, we've lost our thanks living because our, our circumstances have changed. And you know, If you look at life and what's in front of you, you can lose your thanks living very fast. We have COVID going on. You go to the gas station. Well, every time I go to the gas station, I'm always like, it's, can it really get any higher? Like, I feel like we've seen this thing go from like a dollar to like where it's getting close to four dollars in a matter of three years and then you just see inflation i go to to buy bacon like it was like two weeks ago i'm like i thought bacon was like half this last time i was at the store and and, and looking at the bill and i'm like oh my gosh like this is like getting to be a, like a mortgage payment just to get food for a couple weeks for a family of four like it's it just there's a lot of things you can start to look at in front of you when it comes to, to politics and what's on the news and all this stuff, and, and you can start to lose sight of all the blessings in your life. You can go onto social media, and you can start to see how everyone has such nicer things more than you. That person had a better vacation than you, and that person seems like they have a happier, happier family than you, that nicer house, a nicer car. Uh, it seems like when you go onto these things, it reminds you of all the things you don't have. And so it's easy in this world to lose our thanks living, but God has called us to live in a lifestyle of thanks living. It's his will. And if it's his will for our life, then, then we have to understand that it's not by circumstances that we can allow these things to change us. We can't live a life of thankfulness based upon our, our situations and what's currently in front of us, or we will never live out the life that God has called us to live. And in, when times we go through these seasons where in front of us there's just a bunch of crap that we're dealing with, we've got to look beyond it to be able to keep our thanks living. And, and John 16.33 talks about that, and it says this, I have told you all of this, and this is out of the words of Jesus, so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Now, this is Jesus' guarantee for your life, and it's not the guarantee that you wanted. There's other guarantees that you get, but this is the guarantee that you really don't want to hear about, but it is the guarantee that we get from Jesus. He says, you're guaranteed trials and sorrows in this life. It amazes me how many people go through life and they're happy and everything's going all great and then all of a sudden a disaster happens in their life and they get mad at God and they get angry and they say, God, do you care about me? And fresh it's like, well, God did warn you that there's going to be these times that are, 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 are there things aren't, everything's going to go your way. 
and we got to be prepared for it. But what do we do to be able to be prepared for that? Jesus gives us insight here, and he says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, I think that you could also say with the, but take heart, you could, instead of say, but take heart, you could put in there, but remember. Now, I, I believe it's important for us to, to remember. When we go through these hard times, we got to say, no, I remember, even though all this looks terrible right now in front of me, I remember, Lord, what you've done for me in the past. I, re I remember my past encounters with you that I've had, and I remember the times that you've gotten me through those years of bondage, those years of addictions. I, I remember that time that you, I wasn't able to pay my bill, but you miraculously helped me in that situation. God, I remember what I heard in that message from Pastor Jordan a few weeks ago. Uh, Lord, I, I remember what I read in your word the other day. I remember those Bible stories that I heard as a child. It's time for us to look beyond what's just in front of us. And we got to remember what Christ has done for us. I want to use this as an illustration, our hand. And just put your hand up. One of your hands is fine. And what I want you to do is I just want you to put your hand in front of your face like this. You know what's pretty incredible if you think about this is that here you have, a, you have your small hand. Like this hand is not that big, but I can block out like a whole section of you with my hand. And you're way bigger than my hand, but I can block you. I can block out even that whole back wall and that balcony behind you with my hand. You could probably block out that whole screen right there really easily with your hand. And you know, problems are like, like a, a lot like our hand being in front of our face. Now, these problems that are in these current situations that we're in, they, they seem bigger than they really are. Uh, doesn't it feel like sometimes when you're going through stuff like, I don't know how I'm going to make it. And then looking back, you're like, was I really that upset about it? Like, it was really not that big of a deal. Or you look at other people and you're like, no, no, you just need to just take a break and just stand back. Like, that problem is just way bigger than what you really think it is. And we can be like that in life when, when it comes to problems. And you know, behind us, you know, there, there's just so much blessings behind what we have going on here. Like, you can have people in their life and they have this problem at work happen and they just forget how incredibly blessed they are to be able to have a relationship with God and all the friendships that they have. And they forget about how awesome their, their spouse is and how awesome they are with their kids and how blessed they are to be able to have a, a car and a house and food on the table. But it's just like this one problem is just so big, it starts to infect their whole life and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we have to be aware of these things because I believe that's one of the ways that the devil tries to destroy our life is he tries to distract us. He tries us to get looking at the problems and as we look at the problems as we focus on the problems they just get nearer and nearer and bigger and bigger. Oh, what's pretty crazy is that I can go outside with my hand and I can block out the whole sun and these problems a lot of times block out the Son of God in our life that all of a sudden we don't see Jesus anymore for who he is and there's a story like this in the Bible and in Mark 4, 36, it's with Jesus and his disciples, and it says this. It says, So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind. But a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher! Don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Just think about that for a moment. And we can look at them and be like, How stupid were they? They had Jesus in the boat with them and they were afraid. But yet, look at all of our past blessings that we've had from God, past encounters with God, past breakthroughs and deliverance and healing and, and moments of freedom we've had with the Lord. But then one bad thing happens in our life, and then all of a sudden we start to go to God and say, God, do you even care about me? How many have ever done that before? God, are you even real? Oh, and, and we can be a lot like these disciples in this moment, and it's not that Jesus ever left us, it's just that we got this problem that is blinding us, and we're not 
looking with the right eyes. We're looking with our physical eyes, but God wants us to look beyond what we see that is in front of us and look with our spiritual eyes and see that Jesus has never left us and nor forsaken us. And it's those times that we start to go through these problems that we have to remember, we have to take heart. Just like Jesus says, remember his goodness of the past. Remember what he said in his word. We go through these times not because God is a mean jerk and sometimes we can feel that way, but your feelings lie to you. You know, it's time to grow up and be adults. Like one thing I've learned with my kids is that kids go by feelings. They, they live by how they feel. And what they feel really becomes a big time reality to a three, four, five-year-old. And part of maturity is growing up and not living off your feelings. And uh, that's the same thing to be true when it comes to our, our faith with the Lord is we have to make sure that our, our faith is founded upon who God really is and not upon our emotions and how things are going in our, our life. And I believe that the Lord allows these things to go on in our life, these sorrows, these trials, these tribulations we go through, not because he doesn't love us, but because he does love us. Not because he's not listening to our prayers, but he is answering your prayers. He's just not answering the way that you want it. None of us pray to God, God, grow my faith. God, help me to be more like you. And we're thinking in our minds, God, bring disasters upon my life so you can stretch my faith. You know, like when I pray those prayers, I'm like, God, like, I just want to go from faith to faith, from good times to good times to better times. It's just, like, that's what we're praying for. That's what we're really asking when we ask God to, to strengthen us and, and, and help us to be more like him. We're just thinking, like, God, help us to be more blessed like you. Help us to feel more peace like you. And he's like, well, if you're going to be able to go to that level, I'm going to have to grow you. And growth is uncomfortable. It's not fun. It's not, it's not easy. Oh, when I go to the gym... It's not when I pick up a weight, just say even if it's a weight that I should be lifting, that's uh, a good weight you know, to be able to do 10 to 12 reps. It's not the first five reps that really matter. Like if you, if you really want to grow muscle, those first five, six, say seven reps, they're worthless, practically. It's the ones that are the last ones that really count. It's, if you don't get to those last ones, you won't grow any muscle. It's that one or two last ones that you do are the ones that really put some muscle on your bones. And the same thing is true when it comes to us when we're growing spiritually. It's not those easy times that we're just, everything's perfect and going well, that we, we start to grow some spiritual muscle in, in our life and we really start to have great faith. It's the times that we're going through hard times where we think, no, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Every time I go to the gym and, and I do a set, I, I want every set to feel like at the last rep that I do, I want to feel like I can't make it anymore. Because in my mind, if, if I get to that place where I feel like I can barely do it, or maybe I can't even get it all the way, but at least I tried, then I'm like, okay, that was good enough to, to, to build good muscle. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to our, our walk with the Lord. The way that we grow our great faith is that we can have great faith in times of trouble. It doesn't take great faith. It doesn't take someone that, that is great maturity and the Lord to be thankful when they're just being blessed and when they get a, a million-dollar check in the mail. Like, it doesn't take much maturity as a Christian to be like, thank you, God. I'm so thankful today, and I feel such great peace and joy in this moment. No, what makes a great Christian is to be able to go through hardship. And what really shows you that you're mature is when you're going through these times and, and you're unfazed. Think about Jesus. Jesus is just so incredible. And he's the one that we're, we're to follow in, in our, on our walk and, and to live a life like him. And, and you look at the life of Jesus, and if you really think about this, this is incredible, is that he was, he was never in a, in a moment where he was distracted. Like he never got in this moment where he was thrown off. And we, we all get thrown off in life, right? Like every single one of us has been thrown off. Something doesn't go our way. Somebody uh, starts acting up. There's a, there's a big issue at work that goes on. Maybe you lose your job. You know, maybe you're dealing with some relationship it's, that's just out of left field and someone has a problem with you. But every single one of us has been thrown off, but Jesus was never thrown off. No problem ever faced him. Why? Because he just kept his eyes on his father. 
Whenever you hear the words of Jesus and he's talking about his, what, he's, what his eyes are on, he's always saying, I'm looking at what the Father's doing. I'm telling you what the Father's saying. Like, it was always about the Father. He kept his eyes on his Father. Even up until his death, he had his eyes on the Father and not on his problems, on his feelings. Because if you think about it, the Bible even says with Jesus, he could have got off the cross at any moment. He said, I can call in legions of angels at any moment to take me off this cross and destroy all of you. Like he had the power to be able to do that at any moment. The Father gave him the authority to be able to even do that. If he wanted to just say, I'm going to get out of it last second. I'm not going to follow through with this anymore. But he wasn't thrown off because he kept his eyes on the Father. we got to be like that. If we want to be mature Christians, we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. we we, we, we got to keep our eyes on him, keep our eyes on his goodness, keep our eyes on the word of God. we got to surround ourselves by the, the right Christian friends. Our, we got to make sure that our environment is helping us see clearly. Some of you have, have chosen lives, chosen friends, chosen your free time, that are environments that all it does is clog up your view of God. Social media, TV shows. Not saying you can't do any of this at all, but what we do is we fill up our life and we get addicted to these things, and then all of a sudden we just lose the peace of God. We lose great faith in times of hardship. We become just like everyone else in the world because we live like everyone else in the world. We have the same hobbies, the same things that they do, and how long they spend. And then we just think that because I go to church once a week that everything's going to be all right. It's just not going to happen that way. we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. It doesn't take a long time to get your eyes off of Jesus, and you'll be like the disciples. Just think about it. The disciples just came from a healing crusade and deliverance crusade. Like, they just saw Jesus doing great signs and wonders. They've been with Jesus for probably years at that moment, seeing him heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. It, Jesus was with them and caring for them and loving them. Like Jesus had the answer for everything. It, Jesus took care of them with all of their needs. And here they are just because they got their eyes off of Jesus just for a moment because the storm was right in front of them. They started to question who Jesus was and if he really loved them and if he really cared about them. And so we have to watch ourselves. We have to always keep our eyes on Jesus. When you belong to Jesus, our blessings always outweigh our problems. Our blessings always outweigh our problems. It's it's never the opposite. You never can possibly have more problems than blessings when you follow Jesus, when you've given your life to him. I could have the band to start to to come forward. It says in Romans 8, 18, and when you look at this scripture, you have to remember, too, who's saying this. And this is Paul, the apostle. Like, Paul's life was a hard life. This guy had been shipwrecked a couple times. He had been stoned to death uh, one time, and then God brought him back. He had been whipped and flogged, like, three different times. He had lived in jail for many years probably years throughout his life. Like, this guy's life was way harder than any of us. And here he is, and he's the one that is, that is saying these two scriptures I want to read here. And then the first one is Romans eight eighteen, and it says, Yet we suffer now. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. And then 2 Corinthians four seventeen, it also says, For our present troubles are small. And won't last very long. How can you say it's small, Paul? Don't you know what we're going through? Like even that time when he's writing this, the church is being persecuted. The church is being killed. The church is being flogged. The church is being thrown into different arenas and gladiators are killing them and and animals are are killing them. And this is a show and, and people love it. It's just terrible times. But yet he's saying to this church, this present, right now there's just these small problems that we got to go through, and they're not going to last very long. And he goes on to say, yet they produce for us a glory that will vastly outweigh them and will last forever. Our current problems are so much smaller than the great blessings that we have because we belong to Jesus. If you don't have an eternal mindset, if you 
don't have a mindset that can see beyond what's in front of you, you're going to get beat up all the time. It's not going to be enough to come to church and, and stay strong. It's not going to be a, a, enough to even read your Bible and, and pray all the time unless you can really get this eternal mindset. You can see beyond what's right in front of you. For some of us, we just keep on thinking about, I just want to be blessed right now. I, I, I'm looking at right now, and if right now is not good, then God's not good. But we got to have this, this eternal mindset because that's the way that God thinks. He, he's, he's saying, oh, everything's going to be great. There might be some suffering right now, but just trust me, it's going to be so worth it. Everything you go through, that's hardships. There's going to be great rewards in heaven. You're going to get to heaven one day, and one of the things you're going to, we're going to all think, every single one of us is, I wish I would have done more for God. Because we're going to just see all the, the vast treasures of heaven. There's going to be people with incredible mansions and some people with small houses. There's going to be people with much riches and great positions. And there's going to be people that have low positions and they're going to be least in heaven. The Bible talks about, you know, that there's, based upon works, works does matter, but works won't get you into heaven. But works does matter because works is going to get you where you're going to be at in heaven. What's going to be the level of glory that you live your life in? What, how close are you going to be to God when you worship? Think about going to church in heaven where God's actually there and has manifested glory. And there's going to be people that are seated around the throne. There's going to be you know, spots where you can sit, but depending on how your works were, you might be in the way back or you could be in the front next to God Almighty. There's going to be 24 elders, the Bible says. I believe they're human beings and they're going to be 24 people that are going to be right there in the throne room, right next to God at all times. And these are going to be people that really committed their lives to Christ. Like how incredible is that to be with God that close for all of eternity? It's going to be worth it. Everything we go through. No, today I want to, I want to pray for people and I can't pray on to you a thankful life. I can't pray on your life uh, that you have a life of great faith. Like it just, I can't transfer that over you. Like I can pray healing into your body. I can, I can pray spiritual gifts upon your life, but I can't pray for you to be a thankful person. That's a choice you have to make. But my prayer today is that you get that revelation that oh, I'm more blessed. Like my blessings are just so much bigger than all the problems that I face. My, my prayer is that you can see beyond, that you remember what Jesus has done for you and who he is no matter what you go through. If we could just stand to our feet. And what I want to do is I want us to just start. I think you just got to just start somewhere. And Maybe some of you have really almost never thanked God. And maybe some of you wake up every morning thanking God. But I believe that right now as we talk about thanks living I just wanted to end this service and just uh, show you some people how easy it is just to, to thank the Lord and just see what it does because there's a breakthrough that happens when you begin to, to activate your faith there's a breakthrough that happens when you start to, to have a thankful heart the Bible says this and this is a, a powerful scripture in the Bible and it's Psalms and in Psalms it says that we that, that we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and I believe that's a that's a key to the presence of God. That I don't even know if you can enter into the pro, I don't even know if you can enter into the presence of God with spending time with Him with an ungrateful heart. Uh, you you have to be thankful. It, it's it's thankfulness as we go into worshiping the Lord. As we come into our time with God every morning or at night or whenever you do it. it it's the thanksgiving of your heart of the thanking Him and being appreciative. It, I believe is what opens up all of a sudden that His manifested presence comes into your life, and all of a sudden the peace of God comes upon you, the joy. You start to feel more faith. You're like God. You're here with me. Thank you, Lord. And I just want us to just lift up our hands right now. Let's just thank the Lord. There's so much to thank the Lord on. I, I, I don't care how much stuff you're go, there's going on with you right now. No, you can practice right now seeing beyond what's going on in your life. Let's just thank the Lord. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you died for me. Lord, thank you. Lord, just thank the Lord yourself. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you never left me nor forsake me. Thank you, Lord, that, Lord, I, even though I've been so foolish so many times, that, Lord, that you still love me. You still care about me. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Lord, thank you, Lord, for giving me the family that I have. Thank you for the blessings that I have financially, Lord, that I can 
pay my bills and I have a house and a car. And Lord, thank you that, Lord, I have money to put food on the table. And Lord, thank you that I even have money to pay for the gas. Even though it's high, Lord, I thank you that I have the ability to pay for that. Lord, thank you for my health. It might not be perfect right now, but Lord, thank you, Lord, that I do have great health in so many areas of my body. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for, Lord, the, my friendships. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that I have access to buying a Bible. Unlike many people in, the, many people in this world, Lord, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Lord, we just welcome you, Lord, to, to do whatever you want right now in us. Lord, I ask that you would bless people, Lord with your presence, Lord. Help people to, to see clearly right now. Give them revelation, Lord. I just ask that you would begin to just, just turn off the negativity of people's minds and hearts, Lord, that as they would just begin to thank you right now, Lord. I just ask that you would break all doubts, all fears, every spirit that is just gripping them. All spirits of negativity, we just declare them broken in the name of Jesus. Over my brothers and sisters, as they just proclaim Lord, your goodness, as they are just thankful, Lord, I just thank you that you're breaking things off of their minds and hearts right now, that you're giving them eyes to see and ears to hear you in a deeper way, Lord. What I want to do here before we go, and just close your eyes, and you can just bow your heads. I want to give everyone a chance to get right with God. This is the most important part of the whole service, because if you're not right with God, then nothing what I said really matters. The Bible says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Well, we've all sinned. And we all don't deserve God. We're, we're, we're not going to stand before God one day. And he's going to weigh our good and bad. It's, it's just not going to happen that way. It's going to be, did you believe in my son Jesus and give you and give him all of your heart? And that's the only thing that matters because the Bible says it's because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, to come to the earth to die for us. Because as mankind, we were sinners. And because of that, we were disconnected from God. We didn't deserve a relationship with God. Even the best of us didn't deserve it. We all deserved hell. But God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die, to take the penalty of that, that sin and all that comes with it upon himself. And the Bible says... That for those that believe in Jesus, that he wipes their life clean from sin. He takes away the shame. He takes away the guilt. And he gives them right relationship with God in this life and in the life to come. And if you're here today and say, no, I want to get my life right with God. I want to know that I know that one day when I die, I'm going to heaven. I want to live out the life that God has for me here on earth. I want to be free from that shame, from that guilt. I want to be free from those addictions. I want to be free from all the, the pains that I, I, I'm struggling with right now in my life, with depression, with anxieties, with fear. The Lord wants to break that off your life as you come into a relationship with Him. On the count of three, if that's you, say, oh, I want to give my life over to God. I want to know that I know as I walk out of here that I'm right with the Lord. On the count of three, I just want you to slip up your hand. If that's you, one, two, three. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Once you put it up, you can put it down. I see your hand. I see different hands all over. But what I want to do is I want to pray a prayer with you. And this prayer, the power of the prayer works because you believe this in your heart. It's not just the words that you say. And so as we pray this, believe this in your heart, and the Bible says you'll be saved. And you'll feel a difference in you. And uh, if you've already prayed this prayer, let's just pray this with them also as encouragement. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need you. I believe that you died on the cross, and you rose again for me. From this day forward, my life is yours. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's just give them a hand for all those that raised their hand. We're just so excited for this new walk with God that you committed your life with. Them. We have some people that are on the prayer team that are up here that would love to be able to pray with you if you want to, to be able to understand what it means to be able to, to walk it out in this new walk with God. They're here for you. Also, if you need prayer for anything, they're going to be up here. And then also, if you need a turkey, if you are in need 
Uh, we have turkeys out there too for people that maybe can't afford it. So that's yours. Or you maybe have a friend or a family member that you'd like to pick up a turkey and some fixings for. Go do that right away, right after the service. And then also the growth track will be starting for those that are a part of it in the next uh, about 10 minutes. Love you all and have a great Thanksgiving.